a chance discovery of a flower near a mountain spring in Wales would begin a journey for one of the most imaginative thinkers of our time, Edward Batch, a passionate and devoted physician who turned his back on orthodox medicine and began researching the healing power that nature provides for treating disease. Dr. Batch was a respected bacteriologist, pathologist and London physician in the early years of the 20th century. According to his theories, emotions are linked to physical disorders. His flower remedies interact with whatever negative emotions a person is experiencing at that moment to bring those emotions back to the positive. Like many pioneers whose discoveries advanced the fields of science, the life of Dr. Batch was not without controversy. And like other innovators who make unique discoveries, some thought of him as an eccentric but his intuition about the power of nature eventually culminated in the discovery of 38 flower remedies that would change the way people approached the art of healing. Edward Batch was born on the 24th of September, 1886, in the village of Moseley, located just on the outskirts of the city of Birmingham, England. Throughout his childhood, Batch often visited the countryside. He was an intuitive boy, very sensitive to his surroundings, and enjoyed walking among the trees, birds and wild flowers. But in stark contrast to the natural beauty of the open fields was the city of Birmingham. This manufacturing city is considered the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Upon leaving school, Batch went to work at his father's brass foundry. He had suppressed his childhood dreams of becoming a doctor as he didn't feel he could ask his parents to stand the expense of his medical training. But with its constant noise and seemingly claustrophobic conditions, the work environment at the foundry did not suit the young Batch. He did, however, find a very different inspiration from this industrial setting. Edward Batch was a keen observer of emotions and saw how illness took its toll on the workers. Fear of illness was as great a problem as illness itself because a sick man could not work nor afford the expense of large medical bills and the cures offered did little more than mask the symptoms. Finally, Batch told his father of his desire to become a doctor. With his family's blessing, he left the foundry to pursue his passion for alleviating human suffering and went to Birmingham University to study medicine. For six years, Edward Batch voraciously consumed his education, first at the Red Brick University of Birmingham and later at University College Hospital in London, where he qualified as a physician in 1912 and joined the Royal College of Surgeons. A year later, he obtained the further degrees of Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, and in 1914 added a diploma in public health from Cambridge. During his tenure at University College Hospital, he researched vaccine therapy in the bacteriological department. Badge discovered that certain intestinal bacteria were closely connected with chronic disease and its cure. He developed vaccines from these bacteria that were found to purify the intestinal tract. While encouraged by the results of many vaccines, he was distressed over the use of injection, given the pain caused by use of the syringe needle. By the time the First World War broke out, Batch was already highly regarded as a physician. The hospitals in England overflowed with soldiers returning from the front line. Some men had horrific injuries, while others were suffering from the effects of gas poisoning amputations and shell shock, what we today call post-traumatic stress. Although Batch's ill health restricted his ability for military service, he was placed in charge of 400 wartime hospital beds. While spending every spare moment working at his research into bowel disease, during his time spent with the injured soldiers, he began noticing that some, with the same conditions as others, fared much better in the healing process, though he wasn't certain as to why. Unfortunately, in 1917, his efforts came to an abrupt halt 
as he collapsed at work with a massive hemorrhage and was rushed into hospital. Doctors operated on him, removing a cancer already in an advanced stage. He was given only three months to live. But for the tenacious Dr. Batch, there was too much work left to be done, as he felt he had only scratched the surface with his research. Though still very weak and just able to walk, he got back to his laboratory with an intense desire to do all he could in the short amount of time he had. With new purpose, he became stronger, defying all odds and amazing his colleagues with his renewed health. To say Batch was a workaholic is somewhat of an understatement. His window at the hospital was known as the light that never goes out because of the long hours he kept. The following year, Dr. Batch was given unofficial permission to inoculate troops in England, with the result that thousands of lives were saved. This only brought more patients to his door. He ran his private practice where the elite of the profession were located, on Harley Street in London. Because of his immunology research, he was looked upon as a genius with an even bigger future in front of him. And yet, though a successful physician in the middle of the city, Batch's yearning to live closer to nature was one that never left him. He was known to walk to a small park in the city and just sit and look and listen to nature in the midst of the bustling city. Ironically, that same love also caused him great pain, as a city park was no match for the pastoral countryside he had enjoyed as a child. In March 1919, Edward Batch was appointed pathologist and bacteriologist at the London Homeopathic Hospital. Exposed for the first time to the principles of homeopathy, Batch set out to delve deeper into the subject. Of particular interest to him was the Organon, the seminal text on the subject written by the father of homeopathy, Samuel Hahnemann. Though Hahnemann's discoveries had been made over a century earlier, Batch was fascinated that Hahnemann had, too, seen a connection between intestinal toxemia and chronic disease. He decided to prepare the bacteria using homeopathic methods to see if those preparations would work as well as the vaccines. This was a great success, and the new remedies became known as the seven batch nosodes. Hahnemann's theory was to treat the whole person rather than the symptoms of disease alone, and he stressed the importance of the mental and emotional state of the person being treated. Dr. Batch felt a kinship to Hahnemann, as he had always been interested in the individual needs of his patients as people, believing that orthodox medicine concentrated too hard on diseases and not enough on the whole person. He reveled in the idea that Hahnemann's ideas might lead him to the safer and more natural way of treating the cause of disease that he had dreamed of as a child. In his consulting rooms, he began trying to apply Hahnemann's insights by categorizing his patients and searching for links between their personalities and the bacterial nosodes that they needed. He found he could often predict the nosodes he would need to use on a patient just by looking at the personality type. In 1922, Dr. Batch decided to give up his post at the London Homeopathic Hospital in order to concentrate on his research, although he continued to receive and treat patients at his London consulting rooms. He opened a large laboratory in Park Crescent, and it was there that Edward Batch met radiographer Nora Weeks. She too found the prospect of healing by nature fascinating, and she was a firm believer in the directions his research was taking. Later, she would become his assistant, although by all accounts, the relationship between the two remained purely platonic. Batch had long taken exception to using bacteria, the product of disease, as a cure for disease. He wanted to find a natural, pure equivalent for the seven bacterial nosodes he had previously discovered, so he began to experiment with plants that might replicate their effects. Batch's transformation from traditional physician to holistic healer was well underway.
By the standards of his day, when doctors were expected to be rather reserved and distant, Edward Batch was known as an unconventional man. It wasn't uncommon for him to join in sing-songs in the pub and stand drinks for the locals. He would sit in the bar and watch how people behaved. This, in particular, always being an endless source of fascination for him. Despite this sociable side to his nature, formal occasions made him a reluctant guest. At one particular dinner party, in a large banqueting hall, he began examining the faces, gestures and mannerisms of the other guests as a way of curing his boredom. He considered how he might group these personalities and emotional types, and he wondered if those with similar types of personalities and emotions would suffer the same diseases. In a flash, his intuition told him that all these people could suffer from every kind of disease, but the way they reacted to the disease could be grouped together. He realized that the answer to treating disease was not to focus solely on the chronic disease alone, but instead to find a treatment for the negative moods and emotions that were responsible for the breakdown in health in the first place. With the help of these insights, he categorized several emotional states of mind and could see how more would be needed. He was determined to devote the rest of his life to this new system of medicine that he was sure nature could provide. It was the search for these new, simpler and more natural medicines that took Dr. Batch to the Welsh countryside. In Wales, in 1928, he found Impatiens glandulifera and Mimulus guttatus growing wild and prepared remedies from them using homeopathic methods. Dr. Batch began using the new flower-based remedies on his patients. He prescribed them based on the patient's personality and achieved immediate and remarkable success. Next, he added clematis to his collection. These three remedies were so successful that by the following year's end, he had given up using any other medications while continuing to look for more remedy plants to prepare. In 1930, Batch did what other physicians considered the unthinkable. He turned his back on orthodox medicine, abandoning his extremely lucrative London practice to devote himself entirely to the search for new remedies from the pure and simple herbs of the field. He asked Nora Weeks to accompany him as his assistant. Dr. Batch continued to strip out unnecessary ideas and theories from his practice including the old laboratory-based methods of making remedies. Instead, he devised two new ways of preparing the flowers. The earliest of these was the sun method. Dr. Batch placed fresh flower heads in a bowl and stood them in unbroken sunlight so that the plant energy would be infused into the water. A few years later, when he had settled at Mount Vernon, he found a second method, the boiling method which he used for 18 of the remedies. In this method, he would collect the flower parts and boil them in water for half an hour before leaving them to cool. To make the medicines, Dr. Batch mixed the energized water with equal parts of brandy, which was chosen as a preservative. The resulting liquids he called the mother tincture. He then made stock bottle dilutions by adding two drops of the mother tincture to 30 milliliters of brandy. From 1930 to 1934, Dr. Batch and Nora traveled over scattered corners of England and Wales, preparing and testing remedies from many plants. He experimented using these preparations with his patients. Over time, he settled on 19 remedies. Most of the remedies were made from flowers, with the exception of rock water, which was potentized in 1933 using water from a forgotten spring. In a couple of instances, olive and vine, he wrote abroad and asked friends in Switzerland and Italy to prepare the remedies to his instructions so he could try them out on his patients. One of his favorite rural destinations was a seaside town on the east coast of England called Cromer. He enjoyed observing the dynamics between the relaxed tourists and the locals going about their daily lives. 
The observations that Batch made in this tranquil setting reinforced his theories regarding different personality types. While everyone in the town faced similar day-to-day -day challenges, people's reactions to any given situation were very individualized. It was while living in Chroma that Dr. Batch discovered many of the early remedies. Agrimony, chicory, vervain, centaury, serrato, scleranthus, and oak. And it was also in this town where a nautical emergency put Batch's work to the test. On December 14, 1933, a ferocious storm was brewing out at sea. Lifeboats had been dispatched to rescue two fishermen from the sinking barge, the Sepoy. For six hours, the rescue boats tried to launch, but the seas proved too rough. Finally, a lifeboat perched on the bow of the barge and pulled in one fisherman lashed onto the mast who was foaming at the mouth, delirious and not expected to live. In fact, his rescuers felt it was a certain death. As the fisherman was brought to shore, Dr. Batch insisted on trying to save the man's life and moistened the fisherman's lips with a combination of remedies that he referred to as rescue remedy. As the story goes, within moments of Batch's efforts, the man sat up, asked for a cigarette, and was then taken to the local hospital. By this point in Batch's life, the flower remedies were already gaining fame through word of mouth. He had published several articles and books on the healing powers and efficacy of the remedies, yet the medical profession was slow to accept his ideas of healing. He also advertised his remedies in newspapers, much to the disapproval of the General Medical Council. For the next four years, threats were made to strike his name from the medical register. Finally, he retaliated by penning a letter to the council stating that he no longer considered himself a physician, but a herbalist. And in a later letter, he rescinded his association with orthodox medicine, never to hear from the General Medical Council again. After years of traveling, Dr. Batch and his assistant Nora felt it was time to establish a center where they could continue making their remedies. They settled into a rented Victorian cottage called Mount Vernon in the sleepy village of Sotwell, Oxfordshire. Their dear friend, Victor Bullen, a builder from Cromer, joined them later to help them in their work. Batch was delighted to find that almost all of the remedy plants grew within a mile or two of this new home. With his savings from his London practice days now well spent, there was little money left for furnishings. He collected wood and made his own furniture, which still resides in Mount Vernon today. And though money was sparse, Dr. Batch would not charge for his services or remedies. He felt that health was the right of every individual, and his remedies were simply a natural extension of healing. Ironically, it was the patients themselves who felt uncomfortable about the free consultations. Many wouldn't return for a second visit because they felt they were taking advantage of his good nature. So Dr. Batch put a charge on the treatment to make people feel that they weren't just taking, but giving something in return. The remedies were becoming known far and wide. Batch was acquainted with the Nelson family, owners of the oldest homeopathic pharmacy in Europe based in London. He would travel to London to deliver his mother tinctures there and to two other pharmacies. Batch also continued to treat people who came to see him at Mount Vernon. It was also during this time that he himself suffered negative states of mind for which he didn't yet have a remedy. He discovered the final 19 remedies by actually suffering himself and finding a plant that would treat him. The dream of Dr. Edward Batch to create a system using nature as a catalyst to achieve good health had come to fruition. And most importantly to Batch, the new system of remedies was safe, effective, and above all else, simple to use. Dr. Batch made one final dramatic statement. 
he burned almost all the notes pertaining to his case studies and discoveries. He saw the completed system as a gift from nature. He wanted people to see and judge it as it was, without being distracted by theory and speculation. No science, no knowledge is necessary, he wrote, and they who will obtain the greatest benefit from this God-sent gift will be those who keep it pure as it is, free from science, free from theories, for everything in nature is simple. Dr. Batch treated many people successfully with the remedies. He planned a lecture tour in September 1936, but the strain of a lifetime of work had begun to take its toll and he was only able to give one lecture before falling gravely ill for the second time in his life. At the age of 50, having fulfilled his dreams, this exceptional man died peacefully in his sleep and was laid to rest in the village churchyard, a short walk from Mount Vernon. Etched on his gravestone is the inscription, Behold, I'm alive forevermore. And through his remedies, he is. Dr. Batch left his work in the hands of his friends, Nora Weeks and Victor Bullen. In 1958, they raised money to buy Mount Vernon, now better known as the home of the Batch Center, and placed it in the hands of a trust. After Nora's death in 1978, the trust was cared for by her partners, John Ramsell and Nikki Murray, and then by John and his daughter, Judy Ramsell Howard, following Nikki's retirement. In 1989, John founded a charitable trust into which the ownership of Mount Vernon was transferred so as to protect the house and garden for all time. Today, the Batch Center is at the heart of a worldwide education program. Practitioners in every corner of the world register here and promise to work using the original methods laid down by Dr. Batch himself. So while it is now a worldwide phenomenon, the system remains as Dr. Batch left it so many years ago, simple and pure, just like the flowers that grow wild in the garden. And for all involved, the simplicity and purity of this method of healing remains paramount. As Dr. Batch wrote so many years ago, this is nature's way and is right. <laughs>